My field is philosophy of science, and this is a field that is focused on clarifying what the reasoning methods and assumptions are of scientific work, how it is that science gives us our best understanding of the world. Another way to think about this is that it involves specifying what the scientific method is. Of course, there are many different methods that are used in science, and so it's often a project of specifying and capturing what these methods are, how they work, what their justification is. Another way that I like to think of this is with a quote from Carl Siegmund. In uh, one of his books on the history of my field, he has said, um, given that human progress is based on science, what is science based on? And this is exactly what philosophy of science is focused on. What is science based on? What are the reasoning methods and strategies that scientists use in their work? And how does this give us understanding of the world that we can rely on? My name is Lauren Ross. I am an associate professor in the Logic and Philosophy of Science department. Causation matters for a number of reasons. A first reason for why causation matters is explanation. So when we think about what scientists do, a main thing that they do is they focus on giving explanations of outcomes in the world. They want to explain, you know, why is the sky blue? Why does the guinea pig have spots? Why does a human have a disease? Why does this patient have a disease? In just about all of these cases where they're asking a why question, often what they want is to identify and cite the causes that are responsible for these outcomes. We often think of this in the sense that causes explain their effects. So if you want to understand one of the most important things that scientists do, right, give explanations of the world, this often requires a very clear and principled understanding of causation. A second reason for why causation matters is prediction. If you know that an, envi an environmental factor causes a health outcome, you can use the identification of that factor to predict that that health outcome will occur in the future. Right? If a dietary factor causes headaches, you can use the identification of that to predict a future outcome. And of course, that's, that's very useful, predicting future outcomes. The third reason has to do with control. We don't just want to sit back and give fancy explanations and accurate predictions of outcomes in the world. We also want to change them for the better. We want to control them. Causation is essential here because causes are factors that give us control over outcomes in the world. We see this in medicine in the sense that we don't just want to explain and predict diseases, we want to treat them, we want to prevent them, we want to cure them. Causation is essential because identifying a cause for these outcomes shows you what to target in order to change things and uh, change things for the better. And a fourth and final reason for why causation matters is the attribution of responsibility and blame. If you think of a case where there's a car crash in the road and we want to know what is the cause of this crash, the main thing we're interested in is identifying what is to blame or what is responsible for that crash. Is it the driver who wasn't paying attention? Is it a manufacturing issue with the car? Is there a problem with the light signal in the road? In this case, identifying the main cause of the crash is important to us because it's identifying what is responsible or to blame for this crash. So these are four main causation related goals, explanation, prediction, control, and the attribution of responsibility. These matter to us immensely in scientific contexts and also in everyday life. Making sure that we get the right answers to these questions and that we achieve these goals really requires that we have a clear conception of causation, whether a factor is causally relevant to an outcome, and whether it's causally relevant in the right kind of way. My research is focused on three main questions. A first question is, what are the types of causes and causal systems that scientists study and that they identify in their work? 
The second question is, what are the terms, concepts, and analogies that scientists associate with these different causes and causal systems? They often refer to these different systems with different names. So what are those names? And how are they capturing unique features of these systems? And a third question that I focus on is, why does this matter? Why do these different types of causal systems matter? In particular, why do they matter for the explanations that scientists provide about phenomena and outcomes in the world? Why do they matter for the methods that scientists use to study those systems? And why do they matter for science communication, for how scientists communicate their work to experts in their field, and also how they communicate it to the public? What I found in my research is that scientists do in fact use different causal concepts and analogies when they refer to causal systems in the world. More recently, three main causal concepts that I've studied are the mechanism, pathway, and cascade concepts. Scientists refer to some causal systems as mechanisms, and in this case, they often analogize the system to a machine. It's got lower level parts, they all work together to cause or produce some behavior of the system. In other cases, they refer to causal systems as pathways, and here they analogize the system to a roadway. They emphasize the flow of some entity along a route, and they can represent these systems with complicated roadmaps that show you the possibility space through which a, an entity can move through some space. And a third causal concept is the notion of a cascade. Cascade is a concept that's used to refer to causal systems that have this unique feature of amplification. This makes sense because the cascade concept is analogized to a cascade like a waterfall where you have a small amount of water at the very top and then it fans out and it amplifies as the water moves down. These systems are also analogized to the ripple effect and the snowball effect. You have a small cause and it amplifies and spreads through a system. This is something that matters in part for how scientists explain different types of behaviors in the world. These different systems have different behaviors and so if you want to explain different outcomes in the world, it requires citing and studying one of these systems over another. It also matters for the methods that scientists use to study these systems and for how they communicate them to the public. One nice example of this is COVID and the manner in which COVID spreads through the population. Part of what we have uh, discovered, of course, is that COVID can amplify as it spreads through the population. One patient with COVID can transmit it to two and two more, and it spreads in this manner that balloons out. So if a scientist wants to communicate that feature of this causal system, this spread of COVID through the population, it's better not to refer to this as a mechanism and instead to refer to it as a cascade. A cascade captures that amplification feature and that's often exactly what we want to communicate when this type of causal system is communicated to the public and to various audiences. So these are examples of different causal concepts that refer to objectively distinct causal systems in the world and ways in which we can learn from these concepts, analogies, and terms in uh, guiding how we communicate about causality and causal systems to various audiences.